Great, so welcome everyone to the afternoon session. Um, in the next two hours, we will be revealing all aspects of Ego4D and Kristen is taking over, so over to you. Okay, great, yeah, hi everybody. So we are about to go through a series of short talks introducing Ego4D and its benchmarks. And I'll be starting off with an overview of the data set and the effort, and then we'll dive into each of the benchmark tasks. So you'll be seeing a series of talks um, and we have after every two talks, 10 minutes for QA. So we'll pause um, accordingly. Right, um, so yeah, let, us get, let me get started introducing this massive new data set and benchmark called Ego4D. And this is massive in so many ways, including the amount of collaborations that took place to, to make this possible. So here's the team listed um, on our archive paper that's describing this new effort. Um, and you can see it involves a number of individual researchers that's coming from 13 different universities plus Facebook AI. So let me give some context, big picture, you know, what gets us into this space of wanting to, to, to try and, and achieve this project. So we can think about how far the field has come looking at internet photos, images, and videos from a third person perspective captured in a rather disembodied way um, at well curated points in time and well curated compositions. So these data sets have actually been huge and instrumental for the kind of progress we see in the field of computer vision. Um, but at the same time, it's a certain type of perception. And what we're looking to push forward as EPIC um, in the, the workshop itself is doing um, and as Ego4D we hope we'll do is to look towards this first person perceptual experience instead. And I think right away we see how much the contrasts are there. This is uncurated video. It's perhaps from always on camera. You get a multimodal stream from audio, visual, IMU, and others. Um, and most importantly, this is where we think about perception closely related to an agent's actions, interactions, and their attention. So within Ego4D, we are motivated by a um, couple of factors. One, augmented reality. So we wanna have AR systems of the future someday that would assist a user based on their current and past activity, as well as the visual context they have right now. So this is one key motivation why we care about Ego Video and what we'll think about as we develop Ego4D. And the other is robot learning. We imagine robots of the future that can learn not only from their own first person experience, but vicariously through human captured videos. And this is important if we want robots that can act in the worlds that have been created for humans, whether that's manipulating human-centric objects or navigating in human-centric spaces. So then all in all, we're, you know, the context of Ego4D is this shift of the fields or even widening of the field's attention from learning and inference with disembodied internet images and videos towards first person perception where you have agents with goals, interactions and multi-sensory data really tightly in the loop with perception. And as I've mentioned, this has implications for augmented reality and robotics alike. So if that's the context then where we wanted to start with Ego4D is to tackle um, a data set problem. So there's been really influential data sets coming in the recent years, especially that are inspirational to what we're doing in Ego4D. Um, but what we were after is to really enhance the scale, content, and diversity. So the largest data set um, to date has had 45 individuals and 100 hours of content taking place in a couple of uh, cities and in kitchens alone. So of course, this is hugely influential for what we can do today in Ego Video, but we were looking in Ego4D to take it to the next level uh, in terms of those, fun those parameters you see here. So the amount of video, yes, um, but also the number of people wearing cameras and number of places and scenes and activities that they do. So finally then with all that um, intro, this is the one slide statement of what Ego4D is all about. It is a large scale in the wild, unscripted first person video data set. We took forth this effort in order to catalyze research on egocentric perception. And there's two parts, data and benchmarks. So on the content side of data, there are more than 3000 hours of video in this data set that we're publicly releasing from 74 cities and nine different countries. The people wearing the cameras 
They're not just graduate students, as we'll see in a moment, and there's more than 850 of them. The video itself, daily life activity, and this is motivated by the, the applications or the, the goals I mentioned before in AR and robotics. These are going to be everyday stuff, people in their home, at work, shopping, errands, commuting. There's multimodal data in Ego 4D, which I'll come back to. It includes audio and 3D scans, as well as IMU, stereo, and multi-camera capture. And in addition to the data, we're providing a suite of benchmark challenges. And we'll be getting into details of those later in the session. And these will be what we hope can drive hand in hand with the data uh, progress in this area of research. The project has been going on um, really over two years and um, collection began of the video in early 2020. We just released the paper for the effort and the data is coming at the end of November. All right, so that was like the one slide cheat sheet about what is Ego 4D. Now I only get you some visuals and dive into some of these details. So the consortium, I said, um, there were a number of collaborators, a large number of collaborators in this project. And here you see them plotted out in the map. So these are all the different institutions that make up the Ego 4D consortium. And you'll see that this is a team that's strong both in its expertise in the area, as well as the geographic diversity. And this plays a great role in allowing us to see video from many parts of the world. The 855 camera wares. So, uh, I mentioned that a goal was to move into um, in the wild capture unscripted and from people from different walks of life. And so here you have what is the composition of the 3000 plus hours and the 855 people in terms of ages on the bar chart, countries of residence on that circular chart, uh, gender, and then occupation in the word cloud surrounding. And this is very exciting because you can see, you know, there are people coming into this data from nine different countries, including five different states within the US, about an even mix of male, female, people ranging in age from 18 years old to more than 80 years old, and all the occupations that you see represented here. Now, what's, what are these people doing in the videos that they captured? So our goal in Ego 4D was to think about, again, that daily life scenario kind of activity. So for that, we started by looking at this list from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics that indicates how many of us spend the bulk of our time. And these are things like in the home, um, cleaning, cooking, eating, doing chores, also entertainment time, exercise, commuting, things in the workplace, running errands. And so we didn't have, ask anyone to script out doing these activities, um, but we did manage to arrange so that cameras would go to people that would be doing various pockets of these activities in their daily life. And so a key tenet for Ego 4D is to capture unscripted daily life activity. And by doing this, here's where we arrived for this first release of more than 3000 hours of content. There's a wide variety um, of activity. It's indoor, it's outdoor. And you can see the, the breakdown here on this circular chart of the different chunks of the data and some of the bigger chunks. And then about a third of it, a, uh, on the right hand side is broken out into uh, a long distribution, long tail of other activities. And just give you a sense of magnitude here, cooking comprises 11% only of the data, but that's already um, more than 300 hours of content. We'll look at for some samples in a moment. Uh, now the cameras that were used to do this capture are, um, many of them are shown here. So. There's the GoPro, that's a lot of the camera video, but there's also the Vuzix Blade, Pupil Lab, Z-Shade, WeView. These are all off the shelf cameras that were deployed by the teams to their camera wares um, in order to have a diversity of modalities and in order to account for different needs in the battery life. Furthermore, at Ego 40 at large, we wanted to not overfit the whole data set to a single capture device. Now, another very important thing in even just setting up this project was to attend to planning for privacy and ethics in this capture. And so this comprised of many um, detailed policies done by each of the groups doing this capture, and you can read about those details in the paper. But in short, this involves you know, getting experts in the field who have expertise, not only in video, but also privacy, the identification, responsible data collection, and to have each team undergo its own proper review process as necessary and 
make sure that there was informed consent and consent forms for recorded people where relevant, as well as a de-identification process on the data wherever relevant. So now let us look at some of this video. And I never get tired of looking at it myself. Here we're, we're zooming through a handful of clips from Ego4D. The clips themselves are you know, eight plus minutes long, but I'm just showing you tiny excerpts. And I think you can see this is video captured in the wild. It's indoor, it's outdoor. It's people in their homes, out of the homes. It's people interacting with objects, often with their hands, doing complex manipulations. It's people interacting with other people um, and even the place or environment with, in which they are performing some activity. And you can see through some of these samples too, certainly the geographic diversity um, and the kind of activities that we observe. You can also see that it's unscripted um, and that this is the, the beauty of this passive always on wearable camera to just capture the moments as they play out. And again, with these original videos as supplied in the data, which are much longer than the seconds worth I'm showing here, you get this long arc of the activity uh, of what a person is doing throughout this, um, say, hour of their time. And most camera wearers that participated contributed anywhere from one to 10 hours uh, to the data set. And you can see that some of the, the camera wearers were selected or recruited for their interesting occupations, which have very interesting visual context, like a farmer or carpenter, baker, a mechanic, landscaper. So that gives you a sense, a tiny one, of this massive volume of egocentric video. Now I also want to highlight some of the modalities that are accompanying this video. So different pockets of the data have additional modalities besides the RGB stream. Here I'm highlighting first the 3D environment scans. Almost 500 hours of video is associated with a 3D scan of the full environment in which the video takes place. So you can see those 3D scans on the top row. And then on the bottom row, you can see how then a dynamic video from a head mounted camera um, as the person goes about that, moving about that space is, is captured and linked to it. And these are provided with the data set. Another modality of interest um, with the data on the left captures where multiple people were simultaneously wearing a camera and the synchronized video feeds from each are available. And on the right, eye gaze. And so these are offering yet other ways to um, explore the first person visual uh, experience and modalities that will, will help to open up new tasks. Now the data is a huge part of the story, but it's not the end point. So the other component of Ego4D has been that the consortium members came together to define tasks that we feel are going to drive progress for this field and really push you know, what's possible. And we organize these tasks in terms of the past, present, and future. I'll give a very short mention of the five tasks. And then in the following parts of this session, you'll hear a lot more detail about them. So from the past, this is the benchmark we call episodic memory, where we want to be able to ask really any question about the past recorded video in natural language, or with a picture query or with the name of an object. So this will also link objects to their positions in a 3D environment if we're asking about locations of things. Moving to the present, we're interested in the hands and object task. This is how is a person using their hands to manipulate objects or change the state of an object in the video. This is particularly relevant for robotics. We expect thinking about how to understand how objects get changed in the world, no matter who's doing it. Continuing in the present, we have two socially oriented, people oriented tasks, one on audiovisual diarization diarization, who said what when, and one on social interaction, who's attending to whom. And finally, moving to the future, we have the forecasting task. And this is covering all aspects of anticipation of what actions are going to happen, what objects will be used, where the camera is going to go next. So altogether, these benchmark tasks give a way to explore egocentric vision with this massive data set in, in terms of how a camera wearer interacts with places around um, the person or other objects or other people. So finally, let me comment on the annotations. We have dense text narration given on every second, every moment of the 3,000 hours of data times two. So two people have looked at every video, some two people, and written out sentences for every single action that the camera wearer does, as well as a clip level summary of every five or eight minutes of video. 
This amounts to a density of about 13 sentences per minute of the data and somewhere around 4 million sentences to accompany it. And you can see it really gives the play-by-play -play of what's in there. We've been using it to index the data to decide what clips to annotate in which ways. We've also used it to form taxonomies in a data-driven manner about actions and objects. And we expect it's itself a resource for future research in terms of grounding um, visual perception and language. Then for all the benchmarks that I, I quickly went through, we have full annotations available. And this includes the space-time labels about actions, people, objects, state changes, hands, as well as multimodal labels like queries and responses um, in language and speech transcription. Getting all these annotations were, um, uh, was intensive, took more than 250,000 hours of annotator effort. So computer vision, we expect, can, can really seize on this data set, and we can't wait to see what our community makes of it. We also expect this because of the nature of the multimodal data and the breadth of the data. It can inform research in all the areas beyond that we see here, audio, AR, language, speech, robotics, 3D sensing. So what's next for EGO4D? Uh, the paper's already out, um, and the data will be out at the end of November, as well as all the annotations. And then we're gearing up for the first challenge. So this will take place uh, in June next year. And so we'll be releasing, you know, look for the release of the benchmark challenge themselves uh, by early the following year. So I'm going to stop here and hand it off next to Bernard, who will talk about the episodic memory um, benchmark. And as I mentioned, we're going to have time for Q&A um, next after Bernard's talk. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Let me jump into my slides over here. I hope everybody can see my slides now. All right, so um, I'll be talking about the episodic memory benchmark. It's really a cumulative effort of almost two years of work for from all these main contributors over here and their affiliations. And uh, just to motivate what it means to do or to work on episodic memory, it's basically the idea of imagining a future where you're wearing your augmented reality device and that's, you know, you have your own personal virtual assistant living uh, your life with you. And this assistant will be able to answer queries that you have about your episodic past, what's happened uh, with you in the past. And uh, answer, answering these queries can come in the form of localizing particular objects of interest, moments that you uh, uh, that happen in your daily life, as well as uh, queries that are based on uh, freeform language. So we want to answer things like, who did I sit by at the party? Where are my keys? And so forth and so on. So that's kind of the motivation of why we have this, uh, this benchmark. The benchmark itself consists of three tasks. So uh, they really depend on uh, what, what kind of query that we're looking for. So if this query comes in the form of natural language uh, freeform text, for example, what did I put in the drawer? Uh, the output, the, the input of this uh, task would be this language query, as well as uh, some video, especially, especially if it's a long uh, a snippet of video. And you want to be able to localize the beginning and ending of when this particular, this particular query can be answered. So if the query comes into the form of an, a particular discretized moment or moment class, that a, a moment can be considered a, an activity that usually happens in your daily life, something that reoccurs, you want to be able to understand <clears throat> or to determine when the beginning and ending of every moment happens in your past. For example, when did I last wash the windows? Uh, if this query comes in the form of a visual crop for a particular object, for example, in this case, it's keys, you want to understand where did uh, this, uh, this object uh, show up last in, in your episodic memory. And here, the localization can happen in 2D uh, or uh, spatial temporally, or also in 3D. This is, this, uh, the 3D part makes use of the 3D scans that we have for some of the scenes. So let's dive into each task separately. Let's start with the, the natural language query task, the NLQ task. Here again, the, the query is of the type of, the input query is language, and the video uh, that you wanna find, uh, you wanna search through um, is one of those uh, episodic memory clips that you know Kristen has showed, and you wanna be able to retrieve the beginning and ending uh, of the piece of video that answers this language query. 
So let me just give you some statistics of the data collection part of this task. Um, of course, and I'll, I'll mention this over and over again, the, uh, more details are in our archive paper, and uh, please reach out with any questions that you might have during the Q&A session. So for this task, for the NLQ task, we, uh, we had to figure out what types of questions or language queries you wanna, we want to ask, as well as you know, in which videos you want to ask these uh, questions. And of course, we, we wanted to focus in on interesting play, uh, scenarios that, that happen. So we focused on uh, videos that contain a lot of navigation, a lot of movement of the re recorder, as well as a lot of interactions with objects. So uh, we manually filtered down these scenarios from the large set of scenarios that we have. We picked uh, some of the more interesting uh, verbs among the narrations, and based on these uh, narration, uh, th these, uh, sorry, these navig these verbs, um, we, we tried to figure out which ones are the most interesting based on entropy of these verbs in the narrations. We want to try to re uh, avoid repetitions within Eclipse so that the query result is unique within the video. Uh, and we have an official uh, uh, training validation test for anybody who wants to start uh, using the data set once it's released. So the queries come in at various templates, 13 templates in total. These are the top three on the, on the right. And they're coming from 400 more uh, plus hours of video from 10 universities and leading to 25,000 language queries. So you see here the distribution of, uh, on the bottom, a distribution of queries um, uh, with respect to, uh, or the number of video hours per uh, scenario that we have, uh, that we captured the queries from. In terms of the baseline method that we developed here, again, uh, we weren't uh, after building the next generation of, uh, of NLQ uh, methods. We were trying to make use of what's already out there. And so this, uh, the topic of, of NLQ retrieval really is related to video language grounding. And there's some uh, very new methods out there that can uh, perform this task, not necessarily on egocentric video, but on uh, third person video. So we took this 2D tan method, for example, as one of our baselines, and it basically correlates the video representation with the, uh, the language query representation and tries to find a similarity measure of uh, between the two modalities, and we score the uh, the retrieved results based on this uh, correlation between the two. Uh, in terms of metric that's used, we use the typical, we try not to uh, depart too much from what the literature uh, makes use of in a video language grounding. So we made use of top K recall under a uh, a, a a course TIOU, a temporal uh, introduction over union. Um, the reason being is that because we're searching over a long uh, video and uh, you know getting close enough to the retrieved moment uh, or the retrieved uh, query uh, is uh, good enough for us. So we use a 0.3 TIOU here. We see that in the you know the results of this baseline, it gets decent results at recall at one and five, but there's still much more room for uh, for improvement. Um, just in comparison with another dense uh, video language grounding uh, data set called TACOS, we see that uh, the same ben uh, baseline method that's used uh, gets uh, you know, uh, similar results, uh, higher results. So it just tells you that Ego4D really in this NLQ test is, is pretty challenging. So in terms of analyzing what kind of results we get from this baseline method, we see that it's basically solving a needle in a haystack task where you have very short or relatively short queries, you know, on average 10 seconds long, um, and you're trying to find them in much longer videos, let's say eight minutes. So it's really finding something, uh, finding a needle in a haystack. And of course that comes with, um, you know, many uh, technical difficulties that we as a community need to uh, resolve uh, uh, in Ego4D uh, especially. Jumping on to the next task, which is this moment query or the MU ta MQ task. Here we're trying to retrieve all the moments where uh, I do, where the recorder does X, a particular moment uh, uh, category uh, in the video. And here X uh, really, uh, you know, we have to define the taxonomy for what defines what X is. And so to do that, we again, we leverage the narrations that are being, uh, that were created, that were, uh, that were recorded. Um, and we, again, we manually uh, prune down the scenarios that we want to focus on, uh, scenarios that actually are quite interesting, where you have interesting moments existing. And of course, we uh, prune down even further to determine what the uh, what particular moments to look at and to categorize them into these moment classes to build the taxonomy based on the entropy of the verbs used or sh that show up in, in the narrations. Uh, so we end up getting uh, 23,000 moments, uh, which are language, uh, which are uh, um, uh, not language queries, but the moment queries uh, uh, determining the start and ending of the moment uh, in addition to the label. 
So of course we have many, many uh, classes here. Uh, we have 204 classes of moments that we get from uh, the narrations specifically uh, in the taxonomy. Uh, but for those, the one, uh, for the ones that have more than 50 instances, there's 110 classes of them. So it's a pretty long tail distribution of labels. Um, uh, this is uh, not that, uh, this is very typical to the natural world. And so we have to uh, come up with methods that uh, um, uh, address this long tail nature of the distribution of labels. Again, uh, in terms of baseline methods, we uh, pick up a, a recent ICV paper that uh, works on uh, temporal action localization and retrofit it to this task of moment detection or moment retrieval um, for Eagle 4D. So it, it basically leverages a multi-scale approach to be able to detect and localize uh, short and long uh, mo uh, actions within a video. Uh, in terms of the metrics, uh, uh, we, again, try not to depart too much from the literature, and so we look at a mean AP, a mean average precision for the uh, various moment classes, as well as a top K recall metric that we amended, we changed a little bit uh, uh, to, uh, to, adopt to, to adapt to what we have in Eagle 4D, because we're looking at multiple retrieval instances instead of just one. Um, so looking at these results, you see that the mean AP scores are relatively low. Um, and, what, and the recall are decent. It just tells you that there is uh, this task is pretty challenging. Uh, and of course, uh, similar to the NLQ task, short moments, these uh, retrieval results that are very short in time are the majority of the data set and they're very challenging to localize because of the, vi the visual information residing in the short instance um, is, uh, is minimal. And so you have to benefit from context and other uh, cues to be able to localize them. Uh, so this is, tells us that there's more uh, room for improvement, obviously, with these baselines. Uh, just in terms of comparison, um, looking at a baseline of detection for um, uh, for uh, certain uh, verbs in Epic Kitchens, you see a mean AP that's close to what we have here in Eagle 4D. So this low mean AP value, uh, we wish to improve it, of course, and it, it would require uh, you know the community working together on uh, providing new techniques uh, for this task. The final task is on visual query uh, retrieval, and it's the answering the question of where was object X last seen in the video. And X here is the various objects that we have um, uh, in um, in the video clip itself. It could be any object that we provide a visual crop, uh, crop of. Um, so again, in terms of statistics, we have a very large uh, data set of object queries, 24,000 in total from 450 hours across uh, 10 universities. Uh, that's in terms of 2D uh, visual queries. In the 3D uh, realm, we have a thousand queries from the four uh, 3D scans of scenes that we have uh, uh, from the Matterport. So again, to be able to narrow down which types of uh, clips or videos to use, uh, we kind of focused in on scenarios that contain a lot of navigation, a lot of movement of the recorder, as well as a lot of object occurrences. Um, we, uh, we see here on the right that kind of the top five uh, re uh, recurring uh, objects that we see in the various videos. And distribution is down uh, below, again, showing a long uh, tail distribution of the particular objects that, uh, or the scenes in which we uh, captured these, uh, uh, these, uh, these objects in. In terms of the baseline method, we relied on a, a detection plus tracking um, approach. So let's say uh, the video, uh, the visual crop shows up in a query frame in, in the future, and you wanna find uh, the response track or the track of the object that just uh, that shows up just before uh, the object of, of interest. So you wanna find out where uh, did this object show up in the previous frames, um, and you need to figure out kind of this interval of time in which it uh, shows up, as well as where it is in, the, in each individual frame. So what we do here is we, we, we leverage uh, object detection to find where the object, uh, where this visual crop on the right is uh, within the frame. And then we use uh, you know, a similarity measure uh, that to relate the visual crop to various uh, crops in the individual frames. Once we have that uh, good detection of where that visual crop could be, uh, then we track uh, before, forward and backward this object to, get, to generate this, this track. And we compare it against uh, the ground truth response track that was annotated by our annotators. For the 3D visual query task, uh, we have to, in addition to finding where the object shows up in time and 2D space in, in the frame domain, we have to estimate the camera poses in the retrieved tracks, um, as well as estimating the depth of the most recent appearance of the tracked object. 
And then from that, you can figure out kind of the, uh, the, the 3D displacement vector between uh, the object in 3D and the camera in the query frame. And that tells you where an object is in 3D space uh, if you had a 3D uh, scan um, available. Uh, in terms of overall results here, because the task is a little bit new, we had to come and kind of merge uh, metrics from the tracking domain as well as some de detection domain uh, metrics. So we have success rate, temporal, spatial, temporal, AP, average precision, recall. Uh, and in terms of the 3D uh, performance metrics, we have L2 or angular displacement um, uh, between the ground truth displacement vector and the predicted one. So as you see from the, me uh, the metrics uh, down below, you know, we there is room for improvement. The success rate uh, tells you uh, whether we're uh, coarsely close to uh, uh, predicting where the object track is with respect to the ground truth. But the TAP is uh, this temporal average precision is pretty low, meaning that our localization uh, can be improved uh, um, uh, further. Uh, in the 3D task, it's a much more difficult task because you add an element of dimension. You have to estimate camera poses as well as come up with a 3D displacement vector, um, and that's that. Uh, that's uh, that's more challenging than um, uh, than the 2D task. So um, here we're, I mean, th this is the the reason why there's a 4D in Eagle 4D, or one of the reasons why there's 4D in uh, Eagle 4D. Uh, you have this 3D plus uh, um, uh, time uh, component. It's a it's a novel task in egocentric perception. Um, obviously, localization is quite challenging, and uh, it opens up the uh, the opportunity for researchers to come up with new te techniques to lever to address these uh, challenges and um, something that's of interest to retrieval uh, for for objects is the idea of search efficiency and uh, right now this uh, the baseline method doesn't really incorporate uh, how efficient the the search is but of obviously in future rounds and this is what uh, what we'll be looking for something a method that can efficiently and completionally um, uh, completely efficiently uh, uh, retrieve uh, objects in, in 2D and, and 3D. So of course, I, I went through these three tasks really quickly. I didn't go and delve into too many details on each individual task, but I really uh, encourage everybody to visit our website at eagle4d-data.org and look at the archive paper that's, that's online right now for more details. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bernard. And we now have... Um... About eight minutes for Q and A. So as I mentioned, we've got three sets of two talks each, and this was your first two. So we can take questions the next eight minutes, and then and then we'll continue with the next talk. I know there was already a question in the in the chat. I can start with this one. So it says, in today's workshop, researchers share that one of the biggest challenges of ego video processing is object localization, which strongly affects downstream event level applications. I'm curious if the benchmark suite includes or will include more general object annotation other than face and hand object tracking or object segmentation and tracking. Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, what uh, we have is object tracks in the visual queries that Bernard just showed, but of course that's like a, a limited number of objects or sparsely in some sense through the data, but there are object tracks there. There's also object annotations associated with a couple more benchmarks that will be defined next. Uh, or later today for forecasting enhanced objects. So I think the short answer is there are some, but we also feel this is a, a nice way that, you know, a next version with the next 250,000 hours of annotation might start to approach. Um, and so people should, um, are we only expecting comments or questions actually through the chat? Or are we expecting uh, questions through- Through Zoom? the Q&A, yeah. If you can, if you can ask our questions on your Q and A, that's the best option. Okay, great. Okay, the next question says from Vishnu says, "What's the length of the typical continuous video from any given participant? Do you have any videos where there are natural transitions between many episodes of daily life?" So here, the battery life um, is is a is a a point stopper, and so most are you know an hour or less. I think Dima wanted to also chime in on this one. Uh, sorry, I was clicking buttons on your behalf. <laughs> oh, so, so you don't sorry. want to answer. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think the battery is one, you know, a practical matter that meant that videos are an hour or less. Um, and when we chunk them up for the different tasks, typically we were annotating chunks at a time that are five to eight minutes long. Um, and so this is this is kind of the two lengths that are present there. And as far as natural transitions between many episodes, yeah, that's 
Um, does anyone want to comment on this one? I think this would mean, you know, someone say going from the grocery store out to their car, that might be something that shows like a transition point. Yeah, th there were relevant uh, videos on that, but not really. We wanted to minimize the amount of, of lag time or just moving because that might not be interesting, but that is going out to do something, coming back to do something and continuing it. And I believe uh, Bernard Kaust in particular had this these long daily continuous streams. So there are some collections. I don't know the exact, but there is a good number of videos that are really, really long without any stops. And somewhere there are some short transitions between a couple of activities. Maybe I can uh, comment on this. So um, there, there are cases where uh, we give out uh, 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 you know, extra battery packs uh, for people to extend the recordings. And uh, while we asked uh, uh, recorders to uh, record as many hours as they could, it ranged between one and 10 hours. So actually we, we had some recorders go up to that limit. And there are videos uh, that uh, whereby the person is doing something indoors and then uh, exits and you know, does, uh, um, uh, does activities outdoors. But in terms of the annotation, uh, I think the, uh, you know, the, the annotation time range that we were looking at are five, is five to eight minutes. Um, so that's at the, so that I think the data does exist where there's these long episodes of daily life, uh, but it's uh, it was not set up to be a kind of a, a life logging uh, a data set that would require uh, much more battery power and uh, 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 more recorders, I, I, I believe. Uh, but I think with the, with what we have right now, there are examples of that in the data set. They may not be necessarily annotated, but they do exist uh, in, that, in the data set. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning too, like even when the videos got chunked, of course, the source kind of timeline from which they originated is preserved. So one could choose to, you know, index into videos and know, you know, that this five to eight minute chunk is adjacent to some other five to eight minute chunk. So that's not lost. Um, so you get that long, long, long form available. Great. So other question. Um, there's a question. I'm wondering if the actions are causal in nature, sequential actions to achieve a goal. Yeah, absolutely. So because this video is, um, you know, vast majority completely unscripted, meaning someone is wearing the camera and then just being, doing what they do, then naturally um, their actions are causal. There's, there's kind of the agency of this camera wear and they have a goal. And what we see is, you know, whatever that daily life goal is, it starts to unfold in front of the camera. So I'd say all the video really has this property. Um, and knowing that there's gonna be a variety, you know, if you think of those scenario chart in the paper that I, I showed in my slides, there's um, going to be a variety of activities, you know, those that are do have more step-like actions to them. You know, cooking's a great example of that. Probably some, some you know, or baking, carpentry mechanics, or a mechanic working, you know, these will have kind of sequential steps even within minutes of video let alone an hour. And then there'll be others that prop, that have more repetition or, or cycles to them. Maybe some that an example in that domain might be riding a bike or driving a car or sewing on the couch for an hour. Um, so you'll see both kinds. I think there is another one. I don't know if you can see this. Um, how can you go for DB used in VR? Yeah, so in virtual reality, I think um, we have thought less about, but I think augmented reality, um, you know, for sure, it's clear from the kind of real world, mixing the real world with the virtual world and the AI understanding of, of both. Um, this is where the ego video is very important. Um, for handling VR um, or, you know, leveraging ego 4D in VR, I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me is um, perhaps the 3D modeling and the modeling you could do about objects and um, places coming even just from the raw video. This is possible. Others might want to jump in on this. I can maybe add just a comment. Um, I think one of the biggest problems in metaverse is really understanding uh, if somebody is placed in the metaverse for one hour long, Will that change their natural in natural interaction ability? 
So will that, will that inhibit uh, a user in terms of changing the way that they are interacting? So are you training a user to act differently in metaverse compared to how they would have done in the real world? We don't know anything about that. Uh, clearly understanding and establishing a reference and baseline of how real world interactions are is absolutely necessary. So everything that we're talking about will drive that. Great, thank you. And thanks everyone for the questions. We're actually right on our time. So I think we'll go next um, to our next talk, which is um, Chris Katani. And again, we're gonna have 15 minutes with Chris, 15 minutes with Famsi, followed by a QA section for both um, just after that. So Chris, if you'd like to go ahead. All right, we're just taking care taking over the, the video sharing. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about the hands and objects benchmark. All right. So I think we could say that as a computer vision community, we've gotten much better at uh, classifying and detecting objects. So when we're thinking about this benchmark, we're thinking, you know, what's the next challenge in object understanding? So there, I'm sure there are many, this is the one that we've converged on. Uh, the observation that we made was that as people interact with things, the state of an object can change, either through tool use or some kind of hand manipulation. So here's some concrete examples here. So you might have uh, a person taking this cable tie and then tying these cables. And the second one is um, a, a video of a person cutting mortar by their hands or be, uh, bleach being poured out of a bottle or a faucet being turned on. And what you'll notice here is that there's an object, right? There's a target object and the state of it is changed through this interaction. So what we wanted to know was, can we use computer vision algorithms to recognize these object state changes? Okay. So Kristen kind of touched on this before, but why, why would you want to do this? So if we were to motivate this just from maybe an applications point of view, you might want some kind of AR system that can understand some task and the progression of that task as a person is performing it. So there's the example here of like a mechanic using AR. And robotic uh, imitation learning is another one where you might want to record what a person is doing with a first person camera and then you want that robot to mimic it later. And what's important in both of these applications is that we're able to recognize a sequence of object state changes. And the way something is done might not be that important, right? So for it, let's say for like the robot, for example, um, the way a person maybe cuts a, a tomato or a way a person you know, uh, cuts a pipe in half, maybe that method is not so important. What's important is the, the effect, right? What, what did that manipulation bring about on that object? Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to define something called an object state change. And we're going to say that it's a visual transformation of an object from one state to another. And I already showed you some examples of that. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up um, some annotations to support this, this question, this research question that we have. Uh, what kind of annotations will we have? So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take some kind of video snippet Okay, and we're gonna find all these snippets that contain an object state change. And then to this snippet, we're gonna give it um, temporal annotations. So what are the temporal annotations? So let's start, okay, there's like a video here. There's a blue box in the middle, it's called a PNR. This is a short for point of no return. Uh, this is gonna be the moment where that object state change begins. And now that object is gonna change into some other state uh, it might be permanently changed or temporarily changed. The two other temporal annotations are going to be the preconditioned and postconditioned. The precondition is going to be the frame where we see that object last, or sorry, where we see that object first uh, before it, it changes its state. And then the postcondition is when we see that object last in, in its changed state. Right. Um, there's also a semantic annotation uh, associated with this. So we'll have some, some words associated with this state change. Like for example, uh, 
this example here is um, I think it's a welder and it and it's being turned on by by uh, uh, with a spark right okay so that's the state change annotation um, the other set of annotations that we're going to use are action annotations so this is familiar to everybody this is like a verb annotation on that video we're also going to annotate objects so we're going to use a bounding box um, for the objects whose state is being changed. We'll also have bounding boxes for tools that are used for this. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have bounding boxes for the hands. All right. So more of the details are, are in the paper, but that, that's what the annotations look like at a high level. And then once we have all of this annotated, um, here are the three different tasks that we came up for the hands and objects benchmark task. So task number one, and, and I'm going to kind of combine it with task number two because they're they're pretty similar. Okay, it uh, task number one is point of no return, classification, and then localization. All right, so what does this task look like? We're going to have a trim video coming in. We're going to have some computer vision algorithm. We're calling it the PNR detector for now. Okay, and it's going to have two different outputs. So task one it's going to estimate this probability here, the probability that a state change occurred given this video. So it's a classification task. Did a state change happen or not? Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the evaluation of that uh, is going to be accuracy. Uh, the second output is this TPNR. This is the moment, the time frame at which the object state change begins. Right. Um, and so that's going to be a time step and that's going to be evaluated using um, temporal error right how far away are we from the, the ground truth location of the pnr uh, the third task task three kind of changed the names on it a little bit but this is going to be called state change object detection so we know that inside of the video there is some object whose state was changed and we want to find out where it is spatially uh, what does the input look like so the input we're going to give you three frames uh, one is going to be the point of no return frame, precondition frame, and a postcondition frame. That's going to go into your computer vision algorithm to find out where the state change object is. And what we want as output is a bounding box on the object in all three of those frames. Okay, so very similar to um, object detection, except you have an image triplet coming out and then you need to have this structured output where you have three bounding boxes coming out, or three or more actually, right? Because if you uh, cut out an object in half, that can turn into more than one object. All right, so those are the three benchmark tasks. Uh, in the paper, what you'll see is uh, a set of, um, of some results, but let me tell you, I guess, about the, the statistics of the, the data set that we have first. So in the version that we have now, uh, at least as of this month, um, for this benchmark task, we have 116 hours. It covers seven geographic locations, 53 scenarios, and almost 400 different participants. Uh, what we've labeled is 1 million bounding boxes, and you can see the breakup there. So it you can decompose it into about 300,000 hand boxes, 300,000 object boxes, and 60,000 tool boxes. Um, we've split up the video uh, clips into train validation and test in total we're going to have about a hundred thousand video clips each one is six seconds long and you can see the decomposition there so 45,000 for train 31 for tr validation and 32 for test okay so what I wanted to show you was uh, the results that we have so far for these baseline tasks so for the object state change classification so we're trying to remember, we're going to be given a video. We want to know if there's an object state change. Uh, we ran a couple of baselines. So uh, we could just say that uh, there's always a state change in the video. Uh, that's going to give us an accuracy of about 51%. Um, that's because that's the way that we split up the uh, the training or the test data to be roughly 50-50 between a with and without an object state change. Uh, we have I3D ResNet and bidirectional LSTM. And you can see that the test performance is a little bit better, but really not that much better. And so what we're hoping as a community is that um, we'll figure out you know, different models that are gonna give us better results on this task. 
Uh, task two is the point of no return temporal localization. So remember for this one, we're going to be given a video clip and we want to identify that frame where the object state change has begun. Uh, we tried different baselines, kind of a naive baseline is let's always pick the middle of the video clip. And that gives us an error of about 1.1 seconds. You see the different baselines there. Uh, the base, best baseline we have right now is a mixture of the slow fast network and perceiver, which is the transformer. And that's giving us about 0 0.5 seconds in error. Okay. Uh, the third task is the state change object detection. Um, so this is the one that probably requires a little bit more thought um, and is really going to need to go beyond what we did in the baselines here. Um, all we did right, is actually uh, look at the point of no return frame. So that's one frame where the object state change is happening. And we're just trying to detect where the, where the object is in that one frame. So we tried that with faster RCNN, debtor center net, and the 100 days of, of hands model, which is pre-trained on their data set, not fine-tuned on Ego 40. So we have a pretty bad performance on this. Um, it, you can see that the average precision there that's averaged over the different overlaps, pretty low. Uh, we think this is going to be probably the most important task, but also the hardest. Uh, and what's really lacking with our baselines right now is it's really not taking into information about the precondition frame and the post-condition frame. So it has no, our basic models have no concept of before and after, basically. So I think that's one of the reasons why the performance here is pretty bad. Okay. So uh, to wrap up, I kind of want to uh, contrast this task to some other tasks that we know in computer vision. Some of you may be looking at these hands and object benchmark tasks and saying, isn't this just action recognition? You're just giving a fancy name to action recognition, right? You're calling it state change detection, but isn't just like a action, actionness detector. So uh, on one hand, yes. So hand motion, right? So actions of the hand can be a very strong indicator of object state change, right? So how you use your hands, maybe if you didn't see anything else except for the hands, that could be a strong indicator of an object state change. Okay. But what we're hoping is that you don't overfit to that. Okay. So I said, uh, you know, in the second bullet point, point, no. Okay. So it's not just action recognition. Remember, we want to recognize what, how, and when the object has changed, right? And, and we want to, you know, make the statement that overfitting to actions is not the same thing as understanding an object state change. So what we're hoping to see is models that actually look at these object regions and see how they have changed over time. Um, so, you know, maybe even one way to phrase this is uh, if we want to understand the object state change, maybe we force algorithms not to use hand information. Okay. Um, here, here's another one. Some of you might say, well, this uh, object state change detection, it, this, isn't this just object recognition or object detection twice, right? So in some sense it is, right? If you can identify the uh, object in the precondition frame, the object in the post condition frame, and you could see, you know, what the difference or you just memorize those differences, then yes, it's kind of like object recognition or detection and doing it twice. But then from another perspective, no, it's not just object recognition twice, right? What we want to do is to be in a general way able to detect these object state changes so that it works for any kind of object, right? That we don't want to overfit to all pairs of object state changes that we've seen for all possible objects. Right? We want some kind of um, ability to generalize to different objects. Okay. Uh, and then the last uh, maybe objection is, uh, isn't this just object tracking, right? You had those three frames, you want those three bounding boxes out. Isn't that just object tracking? So in some sense, yes, tracking objects, but it's gonna be under extreme occlusion and pretty extreme transformation. So I, I, I highly doubt that the trackers that we have now will work for this, right? And so I'm alluding to the second point here where no, it's not just object tracking. Uh, in fact, the target of tracking isn't clear until the state change has happened, right? The moment it's happened, then the object that we're looking for becomes clear. So it is a little bit different. 
Okay, so that's it for the hands and objects um, portion. Really looking forward to seeing how the community picks up this part of the benchmark. Um, and th thank you all for attending this talk. Great, thank you, Chris. And as a reminder, everyone will have QA for Chris's talk just after the next talk. Um, and we're making our way through all the benchmarks of Eagle4D. Next, we will look at the um, audiovisual diarization benchmark. And Vamsi will be giving that talk. Just to share my screen. Hopefully, I can see that. Uh, great. Thanks, for everyone. Um, glad to be here. Um, I'm Vamsi Tapu. I'm from Facebook Reality Labs. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about audiovisual realization benchmark. Uh, building upon uh, Chris and uh, Bernard's uh, discussion about previous two benchmarks. So this is the team uh, for the audiovisual visualization. Uh, I'm simply representing the great work done by these colleagues. Um, <clears throat> building on top of the previous benchmark, uh, where the entity of interest is uh, objects uh, from the perspective of ego, here we are interested in modeling the ego's interactions with people in the scene. In particular, we want to model the conversational dynamics from the ego's perspective. Uh, to further understand the scope of this research, uh, is this benchmark, let's first look at some of the examples from the Ego4D dataset itself, uh, just to get a sense of how these interactions are and what is, uh, what are the, some of the nuances that we can pick on. So hopefully the audio gets through, uh, apologies if it does not. I'm just gonna play some other videos. So based on these example videos, I know it's a pretty short uh, sort of snapshot, but based on these example videos, what we did was we made some critical observations, first of all, to understand the scope of the benchmark. First, uh, we see that it is clear that audio is vital for modeling conversations. This is not surprising. Audio provides this 360 field of view and captures rich information from the scene context about the scene context. The second attribute is that the ego moves uh, quite a lot in the conversational uh, situations. The dynamics that is captured, uh, this dynamics captures the implicit attention of the ego in the scene, which is also driven by the implicit intent of the peep, uh, of the ego itself, um, which is sort of vital for driving a particular conversation, leading or trailing the conversation at some point. And this is quite subjective. Um, the third attribute is that ego 40 captures um, a lot of interruptions and overlapping speech content, um, as is probably evident from some of the example clips that I was showing. These conversational breakdown cues are very much natural for how people talk to each other. Uh, it's very hard to capture these, and these are driven by turn taking, uh, which is natural to humans, which is uh, where we combine audio, video, text, knowledge based familiarity with the person in the scene, familiarity with the kind of scene that you want to. Uh, steer the conversation towards many of these factors play into this. And lastly, uh, the we also see that the natural ability of Ego 4D being a worldwide, uh, you know, having a worldwide presence uh, is that it allows for capturing and accounting significant variation in cultures and demographic influence. For instance, there are lots of nuances in audiovisual cues, non text cues, which are vital for moving conversations forward uh, to figure out whether a particular person is in fact in the conversation or not. This is very much culture and uh, demographics dependent. So here's a snapshot of some of the data statistics about these conversational uh, videos. Um, from within the first uh, release of 3000 hours, we have about 746 hours of conversational content. Uh, and this is just a bird's eye view of how the long tail distribution of the number of speakers, the average and maximum speakers at a given clip and clip, and by clip we mean a five minute video, uh, how these uh, distributions look like. Um, uh, Jim is also gonna talk about uh, the data statistics uh, in the social benchmark uh, afterwards. And then go on. Uh, one of the important things that I want to point out is that some of the observations that we made right now are not necessarily new. 
um, because audiovisual learning has seen a lot of attention, particularly in computer vision and natural language processing communities over the last couple of years. Uh, significant research in object categorization, scene summarization, embodied navigation, etc. However, as summarized in this table, um, just a bird's eye view, a bulk of these data sets and benchmarks are first of all not egocentric. They do not contain significant amounts of off-screen speech and interruptions and turn taking cues. And they are not interactive in the sense that the user or the ego is not driving anything there. Uh, the ego is passive in some way. Ego 40 captures all of these, it ticks all these bars. And so based on this understanding, uh, we define the audiovisual that is in decision benchmark to correspond to low level understanding of the audiovisual content. So we're simply interested in this question, who said what, when, and where are they? So AVD comprises of four tasks, very tightly tied to each other, each addressing one of these four uh, Ws. One thing it, that is important uh, is that what we're proposing here is not entirely uh, new in the context of audiovisual learning. This has been looked at in audio uh, machine learning, speech machine learning communities, audio only, uh, of course, not in the context of audiovisuals, not in the context of truly bring in, uh, bringing in visual perspective and a spatial or scene context driven speech and audio. Uh, and so you will see these terms coming up, which is speaker diarization, speaker tracking, transcription, as I shortly summarize uh, the annotations. Okay, so the first task that we're interested in is called localization and tracking. The question of interest for us is, where are the speakers located in the visual field of view? Um, for this particular task, we provide the annotations for all the participants across a given clip. Recall clip is five minutes long. Each speaker's bonding box is annotated and they're assigned an anonymous speaker label. So this is a dummy label and it is de-identified in some form. Only speakers who appear at least once in the visual field of view are um, considered for this annotation. Except of course the camera winner never shows up uh, in the visual field of view, but nevertheless gets a speaker label. The reason for you choosing uh, uh, to exclude people who have never showed up in the, in the visual field of view is the, 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 through this benchmark, we want to truly tie audio and video. Um, so we want to look at users or speakers in the scene who actually have visual content as well as acoustic content associated with them. So for this task, uh, it, this is mainly focused on tracking uh, the localized and detected speakers. Hence, we evaluate this using classical multi-object tracking metrics, uh, mainly clear mod and identity mod, which jointly capture the false alarms, false detections, identity mismatches, and identity switches of the localized faces. This task is challenging mainly because of the dynamics of this ego and the dynamics of, dynamics of the scene. This is natural to the egocentric data. data. The second task is active speaker detection. Uh, the question of interest is who is the active speaker at a given time instant? The third task, which is very tightly related to the second task, is diarization. This is the core of the audiovisual diarization diarization, benchmark. Um, so although this task is called diarization, we're still referring to the full benchmark as audiovisual diarization for simple. So in this, the question of interest is when does a speaker, a specific speaker talk in a given clip? So active speaker detection is a frame level uh, activity. Diarization, is a clip level activity. That's how these two are related. Um, for these two tasks, uh, we provide uh, voice activity of the speakers as the, uh, as the natural annotation, building on top of the annotations from localization and tracking tasks. Here, each anonymized speaker's speech activity is marked. That is a start and the end time of their speech activity within a given clip and including the wearer's activity. So the wearer also gets a lab label, even though they are not in the visual field of view, their activity is also marked. Um, since active speaker detection assigns each speaker as active or not, the binary label at the frame level, we simply evaluate it using mean average precision of such classical metric. The main challenge for this task uh, is really the fact that the speakers are moving in and out of the field of view at a very rapid fashion independent in some form of the ego's motion. And also significant uh, noise coming in from background speakers and background speech. It could be speech that is not related to this conversation, or it could be speech or speakers where the user is not playing a, a, a role or user is not posing uh, 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 an important, uh, user, is, user is not driving, I'm sorry. So in that sense, they're not the active speaker. 
continuing this, <clears throat> for evaluating diarization we borrow the well-studied uh, uh, performance metric from audio and speech signal processing literature and machine learning literature. This is called as diarization error rate. This is a clip level metric. It balances true negatives, false positives, false negatives of the voice activity detection for each speaker and averages it across all the speakers. The bearer's voice, again, uh, being dominant because it's closest to the microphone is the biggest challenge here. And of course, significant amount of interruptions and overlapping speakers are also main cause. Um, the last task in AVD is what is the content of the speech? This is a very straightforward thing. The annotations that we provide here are transcripts for the voice activity for each speaker. And uh, to evaluate this, we utilize word error rate, which is a very standard uh, metric, again, uh, for, uh, for uh, automatic speech recognition and speech synthesis literature. The biggest challenge again here is similar to what we had in diarization, uh task, where voice is dominant. There are a lot of people moving in and out of the field of view of the speaker, not just the visual uh, uh, field of view, but also acoustic field of view in the sense that they're moving between uh, far field and near field um, from the microphone. This is basically the distance between the speaker to the microphone is increasing and decreasing, and it is it has a very natural structure to it as the conversation progresses. This plays in both into diarization much more into transcription, because you cannot clearly uh, intelligibly distinguish as to what they're saying. Uh, here are some example annotations. Hopefully you can uh, hear them again. The audio is coming through. Um, just to get a sense of all these annotations um, together. All right. OK, so just quickly, um, we've also been uh, putting together uh, competitive baselines for each of these tasks. I'm not going to get into the details here. Uh, however, building on top of what I was saying uh, regarding the challenges of these four tasks, what we are seeing over and again is that although independently uh, localization has been well studied, face detection has been well studied, speaker diarization, has been well studied, when you bring in audio visuals, when you bring in ego, when you bring in dynamics of the, uh, the, of the user and the scene, it's, the overall task suit becomes much more challenging, as you can see uh, in some of the metrics here. The error rates are pretty high. We are improving these baselines, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any of the questions about the models that we have used for these baselines. Um, and also, I refer uh, you all to check out the archive paper and the, and the website. Thank you. Great, thank you, Vamsi. And so we now enter a QA period, and we have 10 minutes where um, questions both for Chris Katani's talk about hands and objects, as well as Vamsi's talk you just saw about audiovisual diarization, um, are welcome. And you can use the QA tool um, to enter. So I think as we await the questions to come in there, um, Maybe I'll kick off with one that I'll just, um, wh whoever would like to jump in first, please do. Um, general question, you know, what, thinking about what's been learned from the baseline running on this data, I think you touched on it a bit in the talks, but if you could say about what has stuck out as far as where research is needed and, you know, including if that's an unexpected place or if it's expected, but, you know, what, what was learned by the, the teams when running the baselines for these two tasks and um, what it, like, what's it pointing to for where we need a lot more work? Yeah, so I, I think I could start it off. So I kind of mentioned it a little bit in my section. So, you know, we're trying to understand object state changes. And in order to understand how an object has changed its state, we really need this idea of before, during, and after. And that needs to be modeled inside of our computer vision algorithms. So, when we are think of, thinking of the baselines, you know, we are with all the collaborators, we we're, were saying, okay, what, what do we do? Like what's out there that that's already kind of doing this? And we had a really hard time finding a good baseline, uh, which is one of the reasons why we just ended up going with a single frame object detector. So um, I, I think, you know, we're really looking to the community and thinking hard about it ourselves. Like what, what kind of models are going to facilitate this uh, probably the closest thing that we have right now is um, something like a transformer where it's, you know, over time looking at all the pairwise relationship between frames. But um, 
I, I think it's a it's a nice open challenge. Yeah. Um, I think uh, on the audiovisual diarization uh, side of things, um, there are a couple of interesting uh, things that we found out which were not as expected. Um, the first thing is that uh, we expected a lot of motion changes, movement in, of the uh, of the of the scene because the person who is looking, the ego is also moving. However, these natural movements uh, that play into the conversation are very subjective, and and so clearly understanding when a particular uh, speaker is attending or is is moving into a scene, and then when they consider a particular person as active or not. Um, what does it mean to say that I am moving a few feet away from the conversation and leaning in to the conversation? Does that have an effect on the ability to capture voice activity and how does that tie into the transcription? So although these tasks are low level and they're well-defined by themselves, like you, know, you give a speech segment, an audio segment, you can run an ASR on it very well. A robust ASR is actually a solved problem. However, when you bring in changing motion, changing perspective of ego, when you bring in overlapping speech content, when you bring in cues that you cannot really understand, things like mm, uh -huh, you know, filler cues, which are very much culture and demographic dependent, you need to solve everything together. We have like three or four low level tasks. You have audio and video, and you need a system that interacts. And in addition to this, uh, just piggybacking on top of what Chris was saying, this causality aspect also plays in where uh, we need to be, the model needs to anticipate what's going to happen in future, just a few moments into the future, so that it really knows that when it, when the diarization, output is being computed, it knows it has a probability distribution or a posterior distribution of what might happen, uh, thereby uh, reducing these turn-taking errors. So you don't want to pick up the active speaker one second after it actually happened. That breaks down everything. So there is a lot of interesting multi-model puzzle and also like you know cross-task research that needs to be done. Awesome. Thank you, Vansi. And our next question um, is from the the audience and question I think for Chris here. Regarding the hands and objects benchmark task, did you try to observe how much audio can help to identify the state change? Yeah, so that, that is a good question. Um, so we, we, we do not include audio as one of the inputs for object state changes, but uh, clearly audio would be helpful. So um, a lot of the video does have audio. Um, also a portion of it, the audio has been stripped for, for different like legal reasons. So um, I think that would be a really interesting task. Um, and then I really didn't think about that deeply and, but I think that would be a great research direction. Um, and in fact, maybe sound in some cases helps you to understand uh, like some kind of invariance and in state change. So I would need to think about that some more. I think that's a great question. Yeah. Oh, I also did, you know, while people are thinking of questions, um, I also did think about that, that first question about what, what was unexpected. Um, and I guess, maybe it shouldn't have been that unexpected, but a lot of the objects that people are interacting with are very small or they're heavily occluded by the hands during uh, interaction. And I think this is going to also be a pretty big, big challenge. You know, everything that we have up to now, I mean, there's some occlusion, but you usually get a pretty good view of that object. But when people are interacting with it, things, they're, they're not interacting with it so that you, you could you know, make it easier for computer vision algorithms to detect things. They're just naturally interacting with it. So their hands are on top of everything. So I, I think that was, that's a big challenge. That was unexpected how much things were occluded and barely visible. And so how do we deal with that um, as computer vision researchers <laughs> when you can't see the object that you're trying to understand? So I, I think that's another big challenge. Yeah, that's an interesting aspect for sure. And I wonder, you know, how much 
this data perhaps can bring to the front like how um, objects can be video entities. I mean, clearly the benchmark does, you know, because they're an object changing state, that's an active event. Um, and even just observing the objects, just as you said, Chris, with like the hand occlusion so present, um, perhaps it calls for approaches that are more video first, um, as opposed to frame based, perhaps getting mm -hmm. some intelligence about, I don't know, the hand track or where the occlusion would be given things over time. Mm -hmm. So Vamsi, um, on the, the, um, the benchmark, I wonder if for audiovisual diarization um, if you could comment on kind of the, the novelty or, or the facets of the capture, which I think you, know, you alluded to briefly and early in the talk, um, since we have time kind of talking about you know, what it offers that really just couldn't be modeled. Like um, you showed the chart of the different data sets and like, um, in that light, you know, what what aspects would you stress as the unstudied parts that are more prominent now? Since we have time, if you could elaborate, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, it's a great question. So, yes, um, I think like one of the biggest, um, I wouldn't say an issue, but one of the biggest limitations of it, the way we have been looking at audiovisual learning until now is the fact that um, there is a scene, the scene is fixed, the background is fixed, and certain entities are, you know, call them speakers, they are moving within the within that scene. So you're you have a very scripted scenario. There is a natural uh, it's easy to anticipate and extrapolate as to what might happen next. And the model doesn't really need to sort of learn too complicated, too much complicated of a, you know, mappings between acoustic modality and visual modality and past and present and the future, even in a given audio segment. This doesn't need to be done uh, at a fine grained level. And that is the status of things, uh, status of how things were uh, uh, from existing audio visual learning, audio driven uh, computer vision and also vision driven audio, like, you know, classical audio tasks. This is mainly because the existing data sets like VoxCeleb, uh, VoxConverse, uh, even AVDIR, where there is an ego, but the ego is fixed. It's a dummy head. Most of these captures, um, there, there is a significant restriction on the movement of the speakers. It's staged, it's scripted, and um, it doesn't allow for any arbitrary changes in the scene, uh, scene type. In Ego4D, we have this a uh, great advantage that that is the center of the that, that sits at the center of the data collection itself we are we are asking the the ego to drive the whole conversation so they have to come in and they have to do something in the conversation they can't just sit and sit back and relax you always have outliers who are like that but there's a need to come and interact and then change things that are happening in the scene so capture wise what this means is Every user wants to look at everybody, every other person. So there is a forcible motion, first of all. And you want to focus on a particular speaker who is talking. You want to drive a particular speaker, a particular interruption when, they, when that happens in the scene. So what this means is, naturally, there is more overlapping speech. There is more interruptions in the speakers. And the user is driving some of those interruptions to take over the conversation. User is trailing some of those interruptions to see what's happening. and that's basically means they're attending. So there is an active speaker going on. And all of this is happening uh, in, uh, in, in a sense of naturalness. So there is not, no script associated with it. So my accent, uh, my natural words. So I have a tendency to say basically naturally, I have a tendency to move my arms up and down a lot um, coming from culture and many other reasons. This comes up and when this comes up, you're using many filler words. And when you have filler words, the whole problem opens up in terms of transcription. We don't have a baseline for that at all. So this capture, uh, this experiment design is complicating the benchmark and it is also giving us a new type of data. It's a bit of a long answer, but that's basically the idea. And I'm sure like uh, Jim also has uh, more uh, great comments about this question. This is a great question. Thanks, Christine. Great, thank you, Vamsi. Actually, and one more follow-up here. Um from the audience, which baselines did you use for tracking people's faces? Uh, that's one part of the question. And then some generic re-ID 
re-identification algorithm on top of the detections, such as deep sort or specific face recognition models, and it's tracking down offline or online. And if you forgot that text, you can pull up the QA since I just gave you about three questions in a row. Got it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. They basically used a very standard uh, face detector. I mean, nothing complicated in terms of uh, in terms of the detection itself. Standard state state of the art uh, face detection. That's the best model out there. Uh, we've used Ava to pre train the model just to make sure that the model itself is reasonably good enough because there is significant blur and change of motion in Ego forty data. Regarding uh, the uh, sorry, the second question was VID. Yes. Um, is if you recall, the first task is localization and tracking. Detecting a face is probably easier. Tracking it efficiently when the dynamics of the ego comes into picture is the harder problem. So we've created this framework where we, we piggyback on top of detections and we create a sort of like a short-term to long-term trajectory mapping. And this trajectory mapping, mapping is a very standard, uh, 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 you know, integer programming uh, and branch and bound type of an algorithm, very straightforward algorithm. Where the idea is you build long-term tracks. You don't you bypass the, uh, the the necessity for reid by making sure that the tracks are all the long-term tracks are all built on short-term tracks. So the short-term tracks uh, errors will propagate to the long-term tracks errors. So of course, like you know, we can always improve these baselines, but that's what we've used. Um, I actually lost track of the third question. So yeah. Um, was the tracking offline or online? Oh, sorry. The tracking is uh, offline, actually. It's not an online algorithm. All the processing and detection and predictions are all done uh, at a clip level, uh, which is five minutes long. So the trajectory itself, the long-term trajectories itself are five minutes long. So this it is off. Okay. Great. And thank you both. Um, and thanks for the questions. We will next transition to the third segment on um, Ego4D talks. And this will, we'll see the final two benchmarks. First, social interaction, Jim Ray from Georgia Tech will give the talk. And then finally, forecasting where Giovanni Farinella will give the talk. And remember, as in the previous ones, we're going to see talk, talk, and then a 10 minute QA for both. And so turning it over to Jim. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, let's see, you should be seeing my screen now. Is it working? Yeah, we can see it. There it is. Yep. Awesome, great. So I'm Jim Ray. It's my pleasure to represent the social benchmark team listed here. Uh, so our mission was to uh, collect naturalistic social interactions at an unprecedented scale. And we're leveraging the same uh, data set that Damsey described in his presentation. So there's a shared data set between social and AV. And I'm going to use my presentation to dig a little deeper into how the data was collected to show some examples and then talk about some unique uh, uh, challenge tasks that come from our social team's perspective. So uh, of course, interaction is inherently multimodal. We're describing here a multimodal capture uh, data set with video, audio, and other modalities to be described. And this is a diverse set of participants across a diverse set of environments. Now, one of the challenges was to do this collection, uh, all this collection actually during the time of COVID-19. Uh, and this necessitated uh, developing protocols for protecting participants' uh, safety and ensuring a naturalistic capture to advance the science. And so the way we solved this was we divided ourselves up into sites. Um, data collection proceeded at each site with an investigator that was responsible for designing the protocol and then working with their local IRB to, to achieve a protocol that was approved and protected the rights of participants during data collection. And as you'll see, this led to a very diverse uh, but, but interlinked and rich set of social interactions uh, being captured. So, uh, just some statistics in the top right, so 746 hours, uh, 378 participants. The scenarios that we, uh, that we address can be divided roughly into two groups, and these are both designed to allow us to collect data from individuals that are already interacting naturally without masks and other kinds of protection. And this was obviously critical so that we could ensure the ability to see faces and to inter interact naturally. Um, and so by working with folks that were already interacting in a maskless fashion, we were able to collect data without contributing to anyone's increase in their COVID risk. So there's two categories here that we targeted. One was you might think of as unstructured interactions in a, in a way very similar to the previous uh, Ego4D challenges that you've seen, essentially delivering uh, sensors to individuals that would then wear them and go about their daily lives. 
And in those settings, we were able to take that data back and then carefully examine it manually to enrich it for the occurrence of social interactions. So the unstructured data in our benchmark task has been enriched for interactions between participants. The second category of collection involved more structured inter interactions, uh, going, for example, to people's homes and then bringing the hardware to them and asking them to play a variety of games, for example, or engage in other activities and capture their interactions during that period of time. And then we would collect the data from them at their site and then return back and process that data. So this structured collection was really designed to be enriched for larger numbers of people interacting simultaneously in a, in a kind of an intense and focused way um, over some, some shorter period of time. And both of these collection regimes together gave us a really nice uh, diverse data set, as you'll see. Now on the sensor front, of course, everyone is wearing uh, some type of head-worn video recorder. Uh, we use a variety of sensors, as you see here in the top of the slide. And then uh, in some sites, some participants also wore eye trackers. So we got the ability to access some gaze data as well as uh, what people are seeing. And then other sites also captured uh, audio in a binaural context with so a microphone in each ear to be able to record the stereo environment in which the person uh, is immersed during the interaction. And all these modalities are available as part of this data set. All right, so uh, the de definition of the benchmark tasks here uh, for social builds very strongly on the benchmarks that BAMSI just described for audio and visual. And we essentially took those pipelines and, uh, and annotations that were designed for audio and visual and, and then extracted from them and adapted them another set of tasks for social. And there's two core tasks I want to describe to you. Um, the first one is looking at me. And you can think of this as for each person in my field of view, for each of my possible social partners that I can see, which of them is looking at me? And so this is a binary variable denoting gaze directed at the first person, at the egocentric camera wearer from each of their social partners, okay? And then the second task is talking to me. It means as each of your social partners is producing an utterance, to what extent is the utterance directed at you, the first person? And so you can think of these two tasks as kind of stratifying this complex multi-person social interaction, stratifying it from the perspective of each of the camera wearers. And we're getting these annotations and performing these tasks for each of the people participating in an interaction. So when you put the collective set of these annotations together, it covers the total set of, of interactions that are occurring. Now, these tasks and these labels are, are, are closely related, but they're not the same. So for example, you can have a situation where I'm talking to someone in the middle of my utterance, I might look away and do something else with my gaze. So there are moments, for example, when talking to me might be false, sorry, talking to me might, might be true, while looking at me might be false. So these labels are interrelated, but, they're, but their exact relationship is actually quite complex and is a function of the social situation and what's going on in the scene. But this has the advantage of framing some, some nice, relatively well-defined binary classification tasks for this very complex multi-person data that was captured. Vams has already described the annotations. I'll just say that we overlaid on top of this, the talking to me and looking in the annotations, as you can see here. And these were done after the face tracking that Vamsi alluded to, and then were done uh, in time and then broken out by frame. And so the task is defined per frame, but the labels are defined and, and, and provided over time. All right, so I want to now just drill down and show you a little more of the annotations and also just give you a chance to see some of the structure of the data set. So this is a clip. Because we're not trying to find out the users from the name. That illustrates some yeah, if you feel nice like pattern of interaction here. You can see different labels occurring. Yes. Yeah. But that's the, that's the so thing. the crux here right now is. So there's a little snippet of, of I think, uh, the Resistance Avalon being played in Atlanta by a group of people. Um, and now I want to back out and show you this from the, from the perspective of all the cameras. Yeah. That's why I was thinking so hard. I was like, hmm. So the video is time synchronized, the audio is time synchronized, all the signals are time synchronized. And then understand the situation from different uh, captured uh, data streams. Yeah, if you feel confident in. So I love this example because it really highlights to me the power of egocentric perspective because it captures a basic fact about human, the human condition, which is that each participant in an interaction, they have a unique viewpoint and it shapes their understanding. Now here we see the unique viewpoint in terms of pixels. What can I see visually in the scene? But there's obviously many levels. So then there's the level of attention. 
based on the audio and visual signals that are available, which part am I actually paying attention to? That shapes my understanding. And then there's further levels of my goals and my experience and my knowledge that further gate what I extract from this exchange that's meaningful to me. And so I think this is a very rich data set that you can work on for, for probably decades actually to tackle some of these very challenging problems of social understanding. All right, so, so let's look at some other data. So this is uh, data from Bloomington. This is the eye tracker. If, if that's the thing, case, there's someone's from eye trackers. You can because <laughs> not gonna these are gonna get shuffled uh, back. Denote in. the eye tracking yeah, that's available. That. This is a nice modality to get at this attention I alluded to earlier. Uh, that's also data? part of the state. Oh, okay. I'm helicopter left. Okay. And these are rather rather structured collections here that I've shown you. But now we're moving to the unstructured. So this is the same collection that Vamsley illustrated before. Oh, yeah. Fragment, these are people yeah. engaged in a variety of, okay. of activities in their environment. Yeah, we want to carry around if we stole it or something. Um, here, this is the audio label. Yeah, just put that up. Fold that in. Oh, so I lost a hanger. Okay. And now we have some, again, more diversity of interactive. This is true. Oh, nice. We open it, turn on it. And then from Twin Cities, we have a clip that's mostly people doing things in their kitchen and not a lot of talking, but the dialogue is obviously critical to the interaction that's taking place. I could, but I gotta cook. All right. Mm -hmm. We have taco salads. We sure can. All right, so the, the video link may not do justice to the richness of this data, but I encourage you to download it when you get the chance and check it out. I think you'll find it to be really interesting. All right, so um, I think we're doing good on time. So I'm going to just spend a little time uh, talking about the baselines and some possible uh, future directions, and then we'll probably wrap up a little early and we can have time perhaps for some more questions. So these are the way to think about this is we implemented some very kind of straightforward baselines, um, just a way to get going to kind of see what accuracy is possible. Um, some of these tasks have been tackled before in other previous work, uh, and I refer you to our paper for a detailed description. But to be honest, uh, for social understanding from the egocentric point of view, there really is no data set of this scale that's available uh, in, in the past. And so it's really unclear uh, how well different models are going to perform. Uh, when applied in this very new setting. So think of this as a starting point. I'm sure you'll have many ideas for how to improve uh, these baselines. You may have algorithms from your existing papers that could be directly applied, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, beat these baselines, please, um, and let's advance this, uh, this forward. Um, but this is a model that takes as input the, uh, the crop face from the face tracker. So this is just simplifying the problem to look at the crop face. And then uh, with that crop face as input over some, a short window in time, it then uses a standard combination of resonant and LSTM to produce the final per frame label for looking at me. And we tried a couple of different uh, benchmarks uh, initialized in different ways and then compared them to random, random chance. And we're doing you know, better than random chance, uh, obviously, but, uh, but obviously at the same time, there's a kind of a big room for improvement, I would say. And I'll talk, I'll talk more about that, uh, that in a second. All right, so for talking to me, um, we need, uh, of course, the, the same input uh, frames recognize, reflecting the participant who's, who's speaking and, and how they're directing their attention visually while they're speaking, but we obviously also need the audio information. And so again, again this is a relatively straightforward baseline, uh, taking the audio samples, extracting from them a standard representation used in speech, the MFCC, Mel Frequency Capsule Coefficients, and then both of these, uh, these streams, the video and the audio stream, are passed into ResNets and then, and then fused to produce the final output. And, and once again, this, uh, this model is benchmarked against uh, random chance and beats random chance, but I'm sure that we'll see improvements in these numbers as more people uh, go to work on this data set. All right, so I wanna just uh, conclude by uh, maybe outlining some, some things we might do in going forward. Um, uh, obviously for the baselines we just presented, uh, there are a number of ways you could imagine improving them. Um, two things in the looking at me task that are missing. So one is that the models that we currently have, while they have access to uh, temporal information, it's over a relatively short uh, scale, and it isn't informed in a more explicit way about the, by the dynamics of gaze. And we actually know a lot about how gaze shifts and changes, um, and some of that knowledge might 
be incorporated perhaps into a model that might lead to performance improvements. Likewise, for the specific task of social interaction and conversation, we know even more about how gaze is coordinated. And that knowledge, particularly if it can leverage the actual context of the interaction, so not just kind of from gaze to some understanding of what's happening, but bringing that understanding of what's happening back to the interpretation of, of where people are looking, that could be a powerful approach perhaps uh, to improve the accuracy. And then for talking to me, um, you know, clearly there's a lot more uh, language modeling that's available than what we've done. Uh, bringing more powerful language models to bear uh, in some of these data sets could be quite, quite useful in terms of getting a better understanding of what is happening at the utterance level. Um, and then there's also the opportunity to model things hierarchically. So not just at the level of from a frame to a short clip to an utterance, but even going beyond and talking about, you know, modeling the dialogue, modeling the extended pattern of interaction, and based on other work that's been done in, in, in the speech communities, for example, we know that this can be powerful in understanding uh, and understanding the meaning of a particular utterance and, who, and, and, and the audience for that utterance. Now, this data set also includes, uh, I would say, uh, a, a lot of grist for the mill. So a lot of uh, uh, signals and, uh, and labels that can be used for other tasks. And we're, we, plan, we plan to define a number of new tasks on, using this data set in the coming year as well as uh, plans to have a kind of competition around the tasks that have been defined. And so we're gonna to continue to work on this uh, and hopefully we'll enlist all of you, your help in, in doing this as well uh, to drive this forward and uh, ultimately build new generations of social AI. All right, so I wanna wrap up and I just wanna again uh, acknowledge and, and, and show you here the social benchmark team. And then uh, I'll stop at this point and take questions. Great. Thank you, Jim. So we are right on time and actually we'll um, defer the questions to the 10 minute section just after the oh, right. talk. Um, so I want to keep, keep track of your questions. Go ahead, throw them in the QA now about questions you had for Jim's talk and we'll, we'll get to those just shortly. Um, the final benchmark that is in Eagle 4D is forecasting and Giovanni is going to present that here. Thank you, Kristen. Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'm going to present uh, um, the forecasting benchmark, uh, which uh, has been performed with the forecasting benchmark teams, um, team, uh, which is uh, listed here in, uh, in these slides. And let me start saying that uh, perception is guided by anticipation of future events. And we use uh, forecasting anticipation to, um, to learn, to move uh, in the scene, uh, to interact with objects, uh, and, and also to, um, to, to act in, inside the scene. And forecasting uh, of the future is something that we have seen in, in popular culture, for instance, in movies, where uh, there is this uh, exaggerated ability um, where the, the main actor um, is able to predict the future and to prevent disaster. Actually, um, anticipation is part of the human intelligence. And uh, uh, for instance, if you uh, look at this, uh, this slide in the, in the left side, you see a uh, destroyed in low, low level perception uh, videos where there is uh, some information of the past and you with uh, your visual intelligence can predict with, which is going to happen in the future. So um, the idea is that uh, in the future, if you want to have a truly intelligent uh, wearable first-person AI systems, uh, these systems should uh, do the AR, but also should reproduce some forecasting abilities, uh, reasoning on the perceived world, and uh, and also for forecasting uh, short and long-term future. So there are also many many um, uh, applied motivation motivation to. Um, to do forecasting, there are many applications to assist humans in time, uh, for instance, to avoid dangerous actions and interaction with the world. And, uh, and, and the forecasting can be useful, for instance, to uh, trigger AR in, in time, or also to uh, send information to other agents uh, which are cooperating and interacting with the human, uh, sending information in time, so, um, the, for instance, the human-robot interaction could, could happen uh, on the right way in time. Um, for those motivation in Ego4D, uh, we defined four uh, challenges. 
Uh, two of them are related to the position tra trajectory prediction. And these two tasks are, are aimed to predict the future locomotion and end movement of the user. And giving um, um, a video of the past, a sequence of, of, uh, of the past, a sequence of images of the past, and uh, eventually um, the past movement, movement history, the model has to predict uh, uh, the next uh, possible uh, future trajectories um, within the scene. Uh, the other two uh, challenges are related to short and long-term anticipation. Uh, regarding the short-term uh, um, anticipation, uh, the models um, have to take in consideration uh, past video segments and has to uh, predict uh, which is the next active object, the object the user is going to interact with, and how the user will use that object, so which is the action is going to be performed. Um, and the model has to be localized the, the object, the active objects in, in the scene. So uh, you should find the bounding box. And also we want to forecast uh, the time to action. So the, 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 um, the time where, when the action is going to be and the interaction is going to be performed. The, this task is a, a bit different than the previous uh, action anticipation task in the literature because uh, we are uh, fusing both action anticipation and next active object prediction uh, in, a, in a single task. Uh, regarding the uh, long-term action anticipation, um, the models has to take in con into consideration a sequence of, uh, uh, of images of the past, has to forecast um, in a uh, long-term prediction uh, a set uh, of action uh, the user is going to be uh, to perform in, in the future. So this is a, a long time horizon and the model has to predict a sequence of actions uh, which are tuple of, of uh, verb and nouns. Um, for giving the possibility to design new models and for the, this uh, forecasting task, we have collected and labeled uh, unscripted data. And, uh, and uh, those data are part of Ego4D um, datasets. And, uh, and the annotated data uh, counts, uh, count uh, um, like 1,000 videos, more than 100 annotated hours uh, of videos, uh, 53 scenes, uh, seven different countries, uh, 397 uh, subjects. And then there is a... Um, um, a long tail distribution for verb and nouns. Uh, we have uh, 170 uh, verbs and more than 550 nouns. And regarding the action segment, there are more than 70K action segment um, leveled. Um, for each challenge, we have provided uh, training, validation, and test fleets. And this will be part of the release uh, in November. And to select the scenarios, we have selected uh, um, those scenarios which are interesting for uh, the forecasting tasks uh, I've defined before. And so scenarios where there are human object interactions and also user locomotion. Uh, and then after selecting data, we, we have uh, annotated, annotated those data. And for, for the future locomotion movements, the annotation has been done uh, automatically using SLAM system. Uh, for the future end movements, uh, the bounding box have been, annotated, have been annotated on on the different frames, and also the sides of, of the ends have been annotated as uh, attributes. And to uh, speed up the process, we uh, started from bounding box given by uh, the ob an object vector on ends, ends in contact, and then the the uh, labelers uh, has adjusted uh, those uh, those. Uh, um, bounding boxes and also um, the labels with respect to uh, the side. For the short and long term anticipation, we started with temporal notation of, uh, of the frames. So we started to uh, from the narration and, uh, and also um, the, the, the annotators as a uh, um, as marked uh, each conduct frame, which means uh, 
the frame where the user will touch uh, the active ob objects for the first time. And you see here a user is going to touch and this is the frame of contact. And starting from the frame of contact, we have labeled the, the actions as a verb and noun. And then we have labeled the, the objects with the bounding boxes. And after these, uh, those labels uh, and those uh, bounding boxes have, have been propagated uh, backward on the pre-contact frame uh, on the preconditioned frame and on three frames before the preconditioned frame um, at steps of, of uh, 0.5 seconds. And since uh, we are uh, considering uh, the preconditioned frames as a first frame before the contact frame, uh, the action dissipation time, time uh, change from sequence to sequence, which is also different from previous challenges on action dissipation. Uh, on those frames, we have also ends uh, uh, labeled, uh, and as you can see, object can be absent before the contact frame. Uh, there is uh, an appearance variability with respect to the ends, and there could be missing ends before the frame of contacts. And of course, we have variability with respect to camera resolution and uh, field of view. Uh, for the long-term object interaction dissipation, the labeling has been done automatically uh, from previous labeling of the short-term anticipation. So we consider that the actions on the conduct frame. And uh, after these, we uh, work at to define baselines and uh, the duty, all the details are in the paper, but um, here we are just summarizing what we did. For instance, for the future locomotion movements, um, we have a baseline composed by uh, feature structures um, and we are using AlexNet and then to do trajectory forecasting, we use a KN, KNN uh, as retrieval method. Uh, for evaluating this, uh, this challenge, uh, we, have used, uh, um, we have used this uh, mean trajectory error, uh, which means to, um, um, to measure the difference between um, the ground truth points in the ground with respect to the inferred points uh, um, of the, of the um, retrieval, uh, retrieval trajectory. And the test has been done on the different time horizon and with different um, um, K, uh, which in, indicates the, the multiple possibility of the trajectory since uh, forecasting is uh, um, intrinsically, uh, is intrinsically, um, um, as a, as a, a, a multimodality um, uh, possibility for, for the future. So you can see some, some results here, but uh, there is a space of, uh, for improvements on, on this task. And for the future and the movements, we have used uh, uh, I3D encoder plus uh, a regressor, and we have uh, measured the results uh, with respect to the displacement error in pixels uh, on the conduct frame and also as a mean displacement, displacement error on the uh, keyframes, which are the, the, the frame uh, related to the contact frame, the pre-frame, the, the pre-condition um, frame, and, uh, and also the three frames before the pre-condition um, uh, frame. For the short-term uh, object interaction dissipation, we use a model composed by two parts. Uh, the first, mo the best uh, component is a fast RCNN object detector uh, to detect the, the next uh, active object. And the second module is a, a slow fast 3, 3D CNN to predict the, the, verb, uh, um, the verb label and the time to uh, contact to, to the action. And the final, the final predictions are obtained combining the two outputs models and, uh, and we evaluated this uh, with a, a standard measure, top five mean average precision. And as you see, the, the, the results are really, um, really low with respect to um, uh, other benchmark on, on the state of the art on action anticipation. So it means that uh, this data set is really challenging uh, for this kind of task. And the last, um, the last uh, challenge is uh, the long-term object anticipation challenge, which is uh, um, performed using um, 
uh, ammeter is composed by three models. One is uh, slow fast backbone, uh, which gives a um, result, which, which uh, is then um, taken as an input for on, on a transformer abbreviator. And then the, 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 there is a multiple decoder for predicting the future action. And the baseline is evaluated using edit distance. Uh, and uh, um, we have evaluated this uh, reporting 20 future actions in sequence and five different prediction to take max over uh, of the final score. And this is all for uh, uh, the forecasting challenge and uh, look on the paper for the details and enjoy the challenge. Great, thank you Giovanni. So now we are in a Q&A session for both the past talks we just saw um, from Jim on the social interactions and Giovanni on forecasting. There is, um, let me start it with a question that's in the QA box. And the question is, in the situations where multiple folks are wearing devices, have you done an analysis to capture how often they mention the devices in their speech with each other? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I'll, I'll take it first and then Giovanni, you can, you can follow. So the answer is no, but we should. Bamsi, did you have something to add on this one? You were nodding. Uh, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with Jim. Okay, actually. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I have a related question actually that might be a, have a more informal answer. So um, your impressions of either from, you know, doing the capture or being present when people do capture about like the typical, like, okay. So you put on a headset, you feel a little weird. You put on a headset on everybody in the room. Maybe everyone feels a little weird, but then it, you know, and yet you're able to get the natural content, I think maybe because they're prompted to do these highly interactive things. But yeah, if you could just comment on that aspect, like what you observe maybe anecdotally about yeah. this phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, it, this is a really interesting point and we've thought about it, uh, but I don't think we're really prepared to kind of give a precise answer. But I would say that, you know, the behaviors you observe in the data are, are really naturalistic. People are cursing, they're laughing, they're talking about each other's personal lives, they're smoking, you know, all these things that, you know, they might not do, you know, if there were actual people in their home standing over their shoulders. Uh, so I think the technology is sufficiently out there in the world and familiar to people. People know what a GoPro is, for example, they know, they know what it does. So I think it, it's initially it's a source of some comment and some conversation, but then it fades into the background. I think pretty rapidly, but I think there would be nice to quantify that in a more precise way, and we're not quite ready to do that. So, Giovanni, a question for you. I'm wondering um, if you could comment or just elaborate on the forecasting tasks. Forecasting, forecasting tasks in general, as far as computer vision solutions and how they, you know, relate and don't relate to recognition oriented solutions. Like, so for the recognition task of activity or, or, or active objects, or, you know, if you take the parallel task from forecasting to recognition, kind of what stands out to you through what you've seen so far in terms of, um, you know, where, where they intersect and where they don't on approach side, if that makes sense. Well, I, actually the task is um, really much different uh, because uh, in uh, anticipation, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, think to have a feature that usually we have uh, in action recognition. For instance, in action recognition, the ends manip manipulating the objects are much more visible uh, over time. Uh, whereas in uh, forecasting, uh, usually you see the hands just before touching the objects. So um, there are no, no possibility to exploit those cues. Or also um, in action anticipation, the, the, um, the appearance of the objects um, is not observed during its change. Uh, which uh, is something that you can 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 exploit, can, you can use in action recognition because uh, 
um, the object could, could change its appearance. For instance, when you open a fridge, uh, the appearance will change completely. When you have to forecast the opening of a fridge, the fridge is closed over time and you cannot observe that. So the tasks are related because we, we wanna understand which action we are going to perform, but the feature that the, the, uh, the machines, the, 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 the mechanism, we, we should explore and we should uh, think to, to solve these tasks are much different than um, the action recognition. I don't know if, if I'm, I'm answered, but. Yeah, and keeping on the forecasting, um, could you comment on the, um, you know, there's a, like as you presented, there's a, an array of tasks, you know, kind of looking at forecasting from many different angles. And I wonder if you could comment on what's, what's been exposed so far by looking at these different angles in terms of, you know, surprises, relative ease or difficulty. Um, I mean, I realize they're all difficult and, you know, the baselines are initial, but yeah, if, if because it's a rich set of tasks. If you wanted to call attention to some aspect, that would be interesting. We add uh, on the forecasting challenge where for um, the forecasting of, of trajectories, because also to, to build um, the data sets, you need to provide ground truth, and that uh, takes a lot of time uh, to compute. Uh, and, uh, and also the baseline we have are still very, very, very simple. Uh, we are not probably uh, exploiting um, all, all the information we have uh, in, uh, in Ego4D uh, in, uh, in, the, in the data sets. For instance, for the short-term uh, interaction anticipation, we are not exploiting uh, in the right way probably ends. Um, we are not looking at the ends, uh, for instance, as mechanism uh, to forecast, for instance, where they are going or where they are moving on the, on the scene. So uh, it's just uh, scratching um, the, the problem. And uh, I think we have a lot um, more to do on, on, on those tasks. So for the moment, all, all the problems were on, on building such uh, um, uh, data sets uh, on the right way that could be explored and exploited uh, in the future. But uh, really, um, we, we have uh, much more to do uh, on, on, on the algorithm side and, and, and also understand better which are the problems and how to afford them. Got it, thank you, Giovanni. Um, I have more questions. I'll continue to check the QA box if anyone wants to add in or if any of the other panelists who are online here wanna unmute to ask, feel, please feel free, go ahead. The next thing I was gonna ask about Jim um, Bomsi as well, um, if you could comment on the, um, you know, the privacy aspects like, Certainly it's clear, you know, the, the data set was done with all proper measures and that's what makes it very powerful for, you know, the field to be able to like tackle work in an in-depth and, you know, kosher way with this carefully um, captured data. And then, um, you know, at the same time, just I know that you think a lot about these issues and, you know, what it'll mean for systems of the future. So wondering if you would comment on this. Um, you know, things we should be mindful of and, and how to think about it for privacy in the context of social interaction, AV. Yeah, I'd be happy to start. And again, Vamsi, great if you can follow. So, uh, so I think, so there's a couple of perspectives. So, you know, in, in the social sciences, it's actually fairly routine to do data collections of the kind that we're doing with appropriate protections in place. What I think is unusual about this data set is that we're releasing this you know, uh, in such a broad way. In the typical study in psychology, for example, the study, the study coordinator and the, and the scientific team would see the data and it would never be shared with, with the broader community, typically, or it might be shared only under certain collaboration conditions. So as a participant, you kind of know 
the space of people, if you will, that's going to see your data, at least conceptually. And our data set is uh, much more powerful, I believe, in part because it has this greater amplification that people will be able to access this data who don't know us personally, you know, we didn't participate in the study design, and they'll, they'll ask questions we didn't think of, you know, and use this to leverage the science. And so I think the, the challenge then from a privacy perspective is making sure that participants understand that this is what's going to happen to their data, that it's going to be collected, it's voluntary, they can choose to participate or not. And if they participate, then the data is going to be still treated uh, with respect in the sense that, for example, we guarantee no identification. So we manually examined every, you know, every frame, every snippet of audio to make sure that no, no names were, were stated that could be traced back to a person, that no license plates, no identifying numbers, no credit card information, no, no, no social media you know, handles, none of the things that you could identify somebody with uh, leak through. Uh, but, but at the same time, you know, people are putting their faces and their voice out into the community. Um, and so I think that, you know, informed consent is the key, is the key piece there is in, in understanding, understanding what you're consenting to when you participate. And I think we're just fortunate that people are, you know, are, I think, you know, willing to, to advance the science, willing to help us advance the science and, and, and in doing so allow us to utilize their data in the ways that we are. Thanks, Jim. I think, like, just to add one more point, I think uh, uh, it's it's also important as a community that we should be aware of the fact that we should poke holes in the data that we are collecting. So this data allows us to actually ask the questions that, you know, or ask the bad questions that people with intentions would do and mitigate it and create uh, new research problems, new research paradigms, or new tasks which are privacy driven. We have not really talked about that in the context of this data set, and this is the first release, but there may be privacy aware tasks across different benchmarks, which talk not just about conversa conversations, but also other objects as well. Object interaction also has some uh, nuances of user, user, you know, user subjective preferences and choices in it. So I think it's, we should probably take this as an opportunity and utilize this data set, uh, building on top of the content that we have and really build privacy aware uh, research problems and, and and talk about them and create new new tasks which are aware of uh, you know which take into account responsibility i really yeah i agree christine if i, I can go back to your question on, on difficulties um for sure one difficult things we well, dif difficult task to, to solve for instance forecasting on short term is the, um, the fact that we are, you, we are using detectors as a, one of the main model, uh, model for um, forecasting the next set of objects. And, uh, and what we observed is that detection uh, is not good enough. So there is space there to improve, but also probably is there not only the, uh, the mod that, that model should be taken into account. So, it seems that uh, we are not done with some, some tasks that uh, in, in third person vision seems to be quite solid, let's say, uh, and in, in this case. And, and also we are considering um, in this moment, uh, human object interaction uh, anticipation as um, something where uh, the human touch the, the next of the objects, but uh, um, Human object interaction could be also considered with uh, interaction between tools that humans as uh, in his hands and, and other objects. So in, in this case, we are not still considering this uh, and there is space there to uh, explore more, more this task. Uh, and then we have also to see how the taxonomy um, we have used here. It was a lot, lot of work to um, to annotate with the right taxonomy uh, this task on um, action anticipation uh, for long term and short term object interaction, we should see if this is uh, the right uh, taxonomy. Uh, well, we should have time to analyze, and for sure the community uh, can can look at it uh, to um, refine and to propose new taxonomy. Um, which is still unsolved. So there are many, many scenarios. It's, uh, it's very difficult in this moment to say that is the right astronomy for, for those uh, tasks. Yeah, great point. I'm glad you brought that up with the taxonomy. 
as well, being very, very inherent to the challenge. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much for the, the discussion and um, thanks to all the speakers that we've heard from so far. We are